Support for Trifles comes from the BSI Press. Manuscripts, collections of papers by international writers, and books covering a wide range of other Sherlockian topics. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And by listeners like you, who choose to support us on Patreon for as little as $1 a month. Patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, Gables, Garadebs, and students all came in three packs, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? What's the difference between a gamekeeper and a gatekeeper? Between a Trigenis and a Trigallus? Between a Jack in Office and a Mr. Cocksure? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 322, Sleepless in Baker Street. Well, hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walner. And Bert, are you are you feeling a, a little sleepy today? Oh, yes. Yes. I like to take a nap in the middle of these programs. <laughs> and uh, that's why Joiner. there's a... Yeah, that's why there's usually a long pause between my statements. I now it makes sense. Uh, yeah. You've you've been you've been cheating on me with our listeners using oh, their no. their their sneaky way out of listening to us. Um, no, look, health is important here. I mean, you know, we all need to be healthy. And well, look at the look at the wonderful sleep that our shows give our listeners. Look at that! It's a service we provide. Yes. Um, you know what's what's interesting is uh, you know for many years as a child I fought taking naps and boy if I had only understood the the genius of the nap uh, and as you say there are health benefits to it so uh, embrace it you know oh, use it yeah. to our advantage yeah, um, absolutely well there uh, will be some stories uh, that we talk about in this episode where people are using sleep to their advantage uh, in some cases their sleep is interrupted this is march and it is national sleep awareness month and as you know every month at the top of the month we are doing uh, an episode based on a national celebration and in that particular month so march has to do with sleep uh, the show notes for this episode, anything we happen to come up with over the course of our discussion that we think you need to link to, uh, we will feature those in the show notes. Of course, it also includes a link to our Patreon page, where for as little as a dollar a month, you can become a Trifles supporter, helping us continue to do the research, gather materials, uh, pay for the hosting costs, all of the necessary stuff that goes into producing a podcast that would be uh, our pleasure to welcome you as a patron so just check that out in the show notes at ihose.co slash trifles 322 or just go directly to our patreon page at patreon.com slash trifles Mm. Well, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm already bored. No, <laughs> just you're sleepy. Not bored. That's all. You're dreaming. You're dreaming. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I am dreaming not of a white Christmas, but just a, of a lovely discussion. We have these every so often here mm. on Trifles, and uh, I think this will be uh, this will be no exception to that rule. There are so many references to sleep; it's kind of hard to know where to begin with this discussion. Well, we could begin right with a study in Scarlet, where there are a large number of uh, references to sleep. Yeah, um, you know, we're we're greeted certainly with Watson as a uh, a war veteran, a wounded veteran. Um, obviously, he is dealing with uh, not only returning to the civilized world after having been injured in Afghanistan, but trying to find a decent habitable place 
that is affordable. And here we are after uh, Holmes introduces Watson to uh, some of the police cases that uh, he's involved with, particularly chasing down an old woman, a ring, you know, et cetera, in A Study in Scarlet. And Watson tells us uh, our morning's exertions had been too much for my weak health, and I was tired out <laughs> in the afternoon. Hey, here we go, Watson Watson trying to take a nap, too. After Holmes' departure for the concert, I lay down upon the sofa and endeavored to get a couple hours sleep. It was a useless attempt. My mind had been much too excited by all that had occurred, and the strangest fancies and surmises crowded into it. Every time that I closed my eyes, I saw before me the distorted baboon-like countenance of the murdered man. So (laughs) sinister was the impression which that face had produced upon me that I found it difficult to feel anything but gratitude for him who had removed its owner from the world. (laughs) Goodness. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, this is Watson, of course, is every man. And it's wonderful when a character, when someone who's telling you a story gives you this little personal insight about Mm. being nervous or being difficult to fall asleep, but also gives you all these wonderful details about what's going through his mind and about and about the case, you know, so it's it's just um, another lovely little dimension. It is. And I have to wonder for a man who had been to war had obviously seen his share of travails, who probably had seen a corpse or three uh, during his time training to become a doctor, how a distorted face (laughs) could have kept him from sleeping. But uh, we are not to judge. Yeah, you know, the whole pace of life, though, is different. I mean, we're talking now about the end of the 19th century. And although electricity had come along in the 1880s, it wasn't common in homes because the Victorians relied on gas and candles and many people went to bed as soon as the light fell. And in general, you know, particularly folks in the country would sleep for around five hours, six hours, and then wake up, uh, do some chores and maybe settle down for a second round of sleep. And that was, I think, historically the, the sleep sequence. And so Watson, you know, would have been probably one of these uh, five, or, five or six hour sleepers. Yeah, that could very well be. Um, well, once again, later in the story, when uh, that, was, that first version was when um, Drebber was found murdered, then Stangerson's found murdered, and uh, Watson's trying to figure out exactly uh, what's going on. He says, then again, if not poison, what had caused the man's death, since there was neither wound nor marks of strangulation? But on the other hand, whose blood was that which lay so thickly upon the floor? There were no signs of a struggle, nor had the victim any weapon which might have wounded the antagonist. As long as all these questions were unsolved, I felt that sleep would be no easy matter, either for Holmes or myself. His quiet, self-confident manner convinced me that he had already formed a theory which explained all the facts, though what it was I could not for an instant conjecture. (laughs) Interesting, interesting. And then then later on, when... um, Holmes is getting some information about um, the the developments of a murder later in the case. Holmes, you know, Holmes is is hearing uh, Stangerson had Drebber's purse in his pocket, but it seems that this was usual as he did all the paying and there was about 80 pounds in it, but nothing had been taken. And then there's a description of no papers or memoranda. And then Holmes says, well, there was nothing else. And Holmes hears, oh, nothing of any importance, the man's novel with which he had been reading himself to sleep (laughs) was lying (laughs) upon the bed, and his pipe was on a chair beside him with a glass of water on the table. Hmm. And then when we get to Utah in the other case of, uh, the other part of the study in Scarlet, as as poor Lucy Ferrier and her circle are being chased around um, the state of Utah, there are many instances of uh, people trying to get some sleep, failing to get some sleep, going here and there, waking up. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, that that particular story is uh, rife with mentions of sleep. Um, 
there's an interesting one I wanted to call out in the sign of four. We'll kind of wrap up the first half of our discussion here with uh, these first two mm. novels. Um, this is when, uh, again, Watson trying to get some rest. And in this case, we have Holmes asking Watson if he'd like him to serenade him to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Which is interesting because in the previous story, he... Uh, he asked Watson when they first met if violin playing was uh, part of his list of uh, rows that he <laughs> objected to. And uh, Watson said, not at all. You know, of course, a, a beautifully played piece can be, uh, I, I think, a treat for, from the gods or something like that. Anyway, in this case, um, Holmes says, um, he says, uh, since, however, we had already determined that small had come from the Andamans, it's not so very wonderful that this islander should be with him. Uh, no doubt we shall know about it in time. Look here, Watson. You look regularly done. Lie down there on the sofa and see if I can put you to sleep. <laughs> and Watson says he took up his violin from the corner, and as I stretched myself out, he began to play some low, dreamy, melodious air. His own, no doubt, for he had a remarkable gift for improvisation. I have a vague remembrance of his gaunt limbs, his earnest face, and the rise and fall of his bow. Then I seemed to be floated peacefully away upon a soft sea of sound, until I found myself in dreamland, with the sweet face of Mary Morstan looking down upon me. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Oh, that is just grand, absolutely grand, yeah. Well, let's take a, a quick but grand pause here to hear a word from our sponsor. In 2023, the BSI Press has added more titles to its roster that you won't want to miss. First up this year is the latest in the BSI Manuscript Series, a title that takes you, well, maybe a moment to connect to the story. The Haven Horror. If you guess the adventure of the retired colorman, you're more clever than Josiah Amberley. This manuscript, once owned by Dame Jean Conan Doyle and bequeathed to the British Museum, is a very clean one, coming as it did at the conclusion of the canon. But the essays that accompany it are wonderfully informative. Dan Andriaco looks at prostheses in the canon. The BSI's resident toxicologist Marina Stajic brings us into the realm of poisons, and our own Bert Wolder tells about the life of the artist Frank Wiles. These and more are colorful, just as colorful as the original story that acted as a metaphor and reality, and it treats the reader to a kaleidoscope of shades and hues that will provide hours of reading pleasure. Be sure to get your copy of The Haven Horror before it's sold out at BakerStreetIrregulars.com today. Okay, we're back talking about sleep for Sleep Awareness Month. Um, seeing as that, as we're just coming off of an ad, I, I thought we might talk about rude awakenings in the canon. <laughs> well, bef uh, that's good. But before we do that, let me just close the loop on Sign of Four because there's oh, something, please. something remarkable that happens in Sign of Four. And it's Holmes. You know, you've just had this wonderful episode where Holmes, as you say, serenades Watson to sleep. But... Um, sleep is on Sherlock Holmes' mind. And I'm sure if most people were asked, you know, did Sherlock Holmes worry about sleep? You would have probably a very emphatic, well, no, you know, he was always chewing away at a problem, conserving his energy. You know, this was not a topic he was much concerned about. But there's a scene, a couple of scenes in the latter part of Sign of Four when they're trying to find the steam launch Aurora and uh, things are not going well. You know, uh, Watson says, well, maybe we could advertise. And Holmes says, oh, no, we couldn't possibly do that. And, um, you know, there's a little conversation. And then Watson says, well, what are we to do then? And Holmes says, take this hansom, drive home, have some breakfast, and get an hour's sleep. It's quite on the cards that we may be afoot tonight again. And then stop at a telegraph office. And then he sends a telegram off to the... Baker Street Irregulars. And then um, later on, very interesting, you know, Watson awakes and he finds Holmes at breakfast time looking worn and haggard 
with a little fleck of feverish color upon either cheek. And Watson says, I heard you marching about in the night. And Holmes says, no, I could not sleep. This infernal problem is consuming me. It's too much to be balked by so petty an obstacle when all else had been overcome. Ah, isn't, isn't that interesting? That is interesting. And that, to me, reminds me of a couple of other scenes. Um, one, in the Norwood Builder, uh, Holmes was really puzzling over this one. Remember, there was that appearance of a thumbprint uh, later on, and he was trying to figure out exactly how uh, it got there, how uh, John Hector McFarlane might actually be implicated. Um, but he's he's got this conundrum, and uh, Watson said, uh, uh, I do not know how far Sherlock Holmes took any sleep that night, but when I came down to breakfast, I found him pale and harassed. His bright eyes, the brighter for the dark shadows round them. The carpet round his chair was littered with cigarette ends and with the early editions of the morning papers. An open telegram lay on the table. So here again, we have uh, an instance of likely another sleepless night by Holmes as he was puzzling over things. Oh, isn't that interesting? You know, you tend not to pay attention, at least I tend not to pay attention to that, but when you start to look for these things, mm. it's interesting that you find these many instances. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to me, that is also reminiscent of uh, a much closer observed scene by Watson in The Man with the Twisted Lip. Mm. You know, they, they went out to, uh, to Kent to stay at uh, Neville Sinclair's house. Uh, and Holmes, of course, had uh, uh, he was preparing for an all nighter. Mm -hmm. Watson says he took off his coat and waistcoat, uh, put on a large blue dressing gown, and wandered about the room, collecting pillows from his bed and cushions from the sofa and armchairs. With these, he constructed sort of an eastern divan, upon which he perched himself cross-legged, with an ounce of shag tobacco and a box of matches laid out in front of him. In the dim light of the lamp, I saw him sitting there, an old briar pipe between his lips, his eyes fixed vacantly upon the corner of the ceiling, and the blue smoke curling up from his silent, motionless, from him, silent, motionless, with the light shining upon his strong, set, aquiline features. So, so he sat as I dropped off to sleep, and so he sat when a sudden ejaculation caused me to wake up. And I found the summer sun shining into the apartment. The pipe still between his lips, the smoke still curled upward, and the room was full of a dense tobacco haze, but nothing remained of the heap of shag which I had seen the previous night. And then here, of course, we have one of Holmes's statements of the obvious. Awake, Watson? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, it's a terrific scene. It really, really is. is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely terrific scene. Well, you know, uh, sleep, it's an interesting thing when you start to look for this. You know, you see other cases. Mary Sutherland, of course, in a case of identity, is so upset about the loss of Hosmer Angel that she says, oh, what could have happened? Why could he not write? I can't sleep a wink at night. And then she mm. pulls a little handkerchief out <laughs> of her muff and begins to sob heavily into it. Poor Mary <laughs> Sutherland. And, and then, of course, you know, interestingly, there's this side reference that I found interesting in Five Orange Pips, where, you know, a lot of the work of the case of the Five Orange Pips is about these mysterious papers that are supposed to be put on the sundial. And there's a comment in the case of the five orange pips where it, where we are told, you know, this register and diary may implicate some of the first men in the South and that there may be many who will not sleep easy at night until it is recovered. Ah, interesting. That's how we'll get them. Our revenge is sleeplessness. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, we're going to keep you awake. <laughs> uh, and then we'll we'll tie you down and tickle your feet with a feather. You know, I don't know <laughs> exactly how torturous it could be, but yeah, uh, clearly that was uh, that was a threat. You know, when when people fear something, um, many times they are sleepless as a result. 
Well, speaking of fear, we do have fear that uh, comes from a rude awakening in the Speckled Band. Of course, Julia Stoner was awoken by a clang and a low whistle. Um, not necessarily in that order, uh, but she asked her sister Helen about them. And of course, uh, Holmes and Watson moved in to uh, experience it themselves. But the, the story itself opens with a rude awakening. And there's, a, there's a, another story that kind of bookends this, uh, this, this kind of opening. Uh, Watson tells us uh, it was early in April in the year 83 that I woke one morning to find Sherlock Holmes standing, fully dressed, by the side of my bed. He was a late riser, as a rule, and as the clock on the mantelpiece showed me that it was only a quarter past seven, I blinked up at him in some surprise, and perhaps uh, just a little resentment, for I was myself regular in my habits. "'Very sorry to knock you up, Watson,' said he." But it's the common lot this morning. Mrs. Hudson has been knocked up. She retorted upon me and I on you. What is it then? A fire? No, a client. Now, now, please, if it was a fire, would Holmes have taken the opportunity to get dressed? <laughs> and, and look, I'm a little pissed off at Holmes for taking the time to get dressed before waking Watson up to see a client. Why didn't he wake Watson up at the same time so they both had a chance to get dressed? Oh, well, it's well known that Sherlock Holmes slept in his clothes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like Schubert slept with a pair of his spectacles close to the bedstead so that the instant he got up, he could keep composing. Holmes sleeps in his clothes, so oh. in case a client comes by, he's all set. I like that. I like that. Well, where's the, uh, where's the similar one? Do you, do you, do you know uh, which story I'm referring to where... Oh, tell me, uh, tell me. Well, I mean, it's, uh, I think it's a pretty apparent one. Uh, it comes from Abby Grange. Oh, yes, of course. Right, that opening. It, uh, it was a bitterly cold and uh, frosty morning during the winter of 97. That I was awakened by a tugging at my shoulder. It was Holmes. The candle in his hand shone upon his eager, stooping face, and he told me at a glance, and told me at a glance that something was amiss. <laughs> come, Watson, come, he cried. The game is afoot. Not a word. Into your clothes and come. Mm. And what a, what a wonderful opening to really, you know, get us all uh, excited about what lies ahead. Oh, it is wonderful, you know, and it's great that so many of the cases of Sherlock Holmes start uh, in these moments of action, which, as you pointed out, were not the same sort of circumstances that that uh, confronted the poor Stoner sisters, Helen, you know, with her bed screwed to the floor. But even so, you know, she couldn't get a good night's sleep. Yeah. Um and, and, you know, I think to uh, some other stories, uh, Alexander Holder in The Barrel Coronet was awakened by a sound in the night. Um, as, it, as it turns out, his son was attempting, uh, the, uh, a, a, attempting to foil the robbery of The Barrel Coronet. Um, then on the opposite end, we have John Scott Eccles from Wisteria Lodge, who slept straight through to 9 o'clock in the morning after being <laughs> asked to be woken at 8 a.m., uh, you know, so we have light sleepers, we have heavy sleepers, we have people who uh, seem to be able to nod off despite anything, people who, uh, you know, are the, the, the merest disturbance of their habitual process or their, their, their regular daily habits is uh, completely interruptive to their sleep patterns. Mm. And we never hear about Mrs. Hudson yawning. I would have thought that Mrs. <laughs> Hudson of everyone in Baker Street you know, would have been perpetually exhausted with the challenges of dealing with Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Indeed. And that is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. 
And now, Watson, I commend to you the universal answer to almost all problems. What's that, Holmes? Sleep. 